Welcome to the fifth lesson of the Pinterest Money Course. Last time we began building our Pinterest monster and wrote the first module writer, which generates texts for our pins. Today we'll continue development and write the second module, the image generator, which will mass produce images for our pins. We'll take two Pinterest pin templates from the Canva website as the basis for our design. Here's the first one. We'll not only replicate the design of this template, but also add other features, such as randomizing background colors, overlaying background images, applying gradients, adjusting transparency for rectangles and circles, changing the number of tips on the pin, and more. For the design of the second pin template, we'll use this design as the basis, and also add numerous settings, such as corner rounding, transparency adjustments, the ability to set borders, change the number of lines with different text, apply gradients, and much more. So by the end of today's lesson, you'll learn how to design using code, become a master of the pillow library, write your own pin generator, and enhance your Python object-oriented programming skills. Regarding the last point, here's what we'll specifically cover today. We'll deepen our understanding of classes, further explore inheritance, inherit multiple classes from an already inheriting class, dynamically create attributes, master the object-oriented programming principle of polymorphism, and work with data classes. Well, we're ready to begin. Let's start developing the basis of our image generator. Before we start developing our image generator, let's make some changes to our writer class and the base class. Let's move the writer's modes of operation into the base class. To do this, we'll create two corresponding attributes in the base class, and then in the writer class, we'll use these attributes instead of string values. In the main PI file, before calling our writer function, let's create a list of available modes and pass the required mode by changing the list index. All right, now we're ready to develop our image generator. First, in the base class, let's create two more attributes with the values of the generator's modes of operation. These values won't change during runtime, so we'll tightly bind them to the class. Note that these are class attributes, not instance attributes. In Python, attributes defined inside a class but outside its methods or class attributes. They're shared among all instances of this class rather than unique to each instance. This means the values of these attributes will be the same for all instances of the Pinterest class and its subclasses. Now let's create a file named image generator PI in the modules package, where we'll place our generator classes. In this file, we'll create three classes. We'll name the first class base image generator and inherit from the base Pinterest class. The second class will be called template one image generator and will inherit it from the base image generator class. The third class will be named template two image generator, also inheriting from the base image generator class. In the second and third classes, we'll implement the logic for each individual template. Any common elements for these classes will be extracted into the base class base image generator, which is itself inherited from the base Pinterest class. So the class structure of our generator will look like this. Two child classes, template one image generator, and template two image generator, inherited from the base class base image generator, which in turn is inherited from the base class Pinterest. Now it's time to define the main methods of our classes. In each of the template classes of our generator, we need a primary public method that will trigger image generation. Let's create such a method in each subclass and here we smoothly transition to the object-oriented programming principle called polymorphism. Polymorphism is a principle of object-oriented programming that allows objects of different classes to be used through a common interface. In our case, the common interface is the method generate image. 
This method can be called on objects of different classes, providing different implementations for each class. Thus, we can use different classes with the common method generate image, regardless of which class is specifically used. The corresponding generate image method for that specific class will be called. A good practice in programming languages that support abstract classes or interfaces is to raise a not implemented error in the base class for a method that should be overridden in child classes. This helps explicitly indicate that this method must be implemented in the child classes and warns the programmer if they forget to do so. Therefore, let's create the same method in the base class and raise a not implemented error in it. In this case, if the method is not implemented in the child class, the interpreter will look for it in the base class, find it there, and raise this exception. In this context, it's useful to recall the inheritance chain and the sequence of attribute and method lookup in classes. Now let's implement the logic for running our generator. Let's move to the main PI file and create the image generation function. It will take the project's working directory and the operation mode as arguments. What do we need to do in this function? First, we need to obtain the data that will feed into the generator. This data is generated by our writer in the image mode, which we wrote in the previous lesson. This data is written to the generator data table in the project folder. To read this data, let's create an instance of the base Pinterest class, then call the OpenCSV method on this object and pass the file name, which we'll also get from the base object. We'll implement the data packing logic later. Now we need to create the appropriate generator object depending on the mode passed. To do this, let's first create a dictionary mapping the generation mode to the image generator class. We'll import these classes and move them into the function. Now let's check if the specified generation mode exists in the generator dictionary. Get the generator class for the specified mode and create an instance of the generator, passing the project folder value to the constructor class. Next, for each data row, we'll call the image generation method and pass the data to it. In case of an incorrect generation mode, we'll raise an exception. Now let's move on to the entry point. For now, let's comment out the writer calling line. We'll create a list with the generator operation mode values, then call the generation function and pass the project folder and the operation mode obtained through the corresponding index of the list as arguments. The launch logic is now created. Next, let's think about what arguments should be accepted by the constructors of our classes and what attributes we need to create there. The first mandatory attribute will be the project's working directory. Let's create the constructor of the base image generator class and accept the argument project folder. Then we'll call the super function and pass this parameter to the base class Pinterest. We'll do the same in the other two classes. What other parameters should the constructors of our classes accept? The main ones are as follows. Let's accept these parameters in the first template class and set default values for them. Then we'll pass them to the constructor of the base class in the super function. Let's do the same for the second template. Now let's go back to the base generator class and accept the same parameters in its constructor. We only pass the project folder to the base Pinterest class. Next, we'll create the corresponding instance attributes and assign them values from the corresponding variables that come into the constructor. Note that calling the constructor of the base class should always come before the instance attributes. This is necessary for the correct initialization of the parent class and the correct operation of the child classes, ensuring safety when changing the inheritance hierarchy and avoiding naming conflicts. Now we need to pass these parameters when creating objects. To do this, let's go to the main PI file and in the image generation function, create a dictionary with the parameters, then we'll unpack this dictionary using double asterisks and pass it as named arguments to the class construct. Now let's design the folder structure of our generator. One part of the folders will be located within each project folder. Here we will create an assets folder inside which will create a backgrounds folder. We'll place background image files for our pins in this folder. Also in each project, we'll need a folder to save the final images. Let's create attributes with paths to these folders and include their automatic creation using the make it ears method. The second part of the folders will contain global assets that don't need to be changed for each project, so we'll create these folders in the data folder. Here, we'll create the image assets folder, inside which we'll create a folder for each template. Within each folder, we'll create a fonts folder where fonts will be placed. 
Now we need to create attributes with paths to these folders. We could do this explicitly, but look at how much code we would need to write for this, and what if we add other templates to our bot? Let's take a different approach and create these attributes dynamically using the setHarder function. First, let's create class attributes and assign them lists containing the names of template folders and subfolders. Then we'll iterate over the list of templates in a loop. For each template, we'll create a path by combining the resource path with the template name. Then we'll set this path as an instance attribute of the class using setArt. Similarly, for each subfolder associated with each template, we'll create a path to the subfolder, then set this path as an instance attribute of the class. Finally, we'll create folders and subfolders at the specified paths using make dist if the folders don't already exist. Next, we need to create an attribute that will contain the design settings for our templates. First, let's implement the logic for describing and storing our settings. For the design settings of our templates, let's create a separate settings file in the modules folder. Here we need to create two classes for the template settings. Data classes would be good for this purpose. Data classes are a special type of class designed only for storing data. They provide a convenient way to define classes that simply store data and do not have complex logic. Data classes allow you to define a class in a more compact form. The init method and other methods in data classes are implemented automatically, so we don't need to create a class constructor here. A data class is defined using the data class decorator. Each attribute of a data class is defined using type annotation and a default value. So let's declare two data classes for the design settings of our templates. Note that each class has attributes with the same names but different values. In the future, in the base class of our generator, we'll have common methods for different templates where we'll need to access such attributes depending on the template. So, we need to create logic to access attributes depending on the template. First, in the constructor of the base generator class, we'll accept another argument template. Then we'll create another attribute template and assign it the value of this variable. Then in the child class, we need to create a variable and assign it the operation mode value corresponding to this template. Then we'll pass this variable to the base class. We'll do the same for the second class. Now we need to create a method in the base class to retrieve the settings depending on the operation mode. Here we'll perform a check and return an instance of the corresponding setting class depending on the value of the template attribute. Now let's create the settings attribute and assign it the result of calling this method. The last attribute we need to create in the constructor should contain the canvas of our image. Before we dive into that, let's install the Pillow library. We'll use the latest version of Pillow at the moment. So head over to your terminal and install the library using this command. Now let's go back to the base class and create the canvas attribute. Then we'll call the image new function, which creates a new image with the specified parameters. The parameters are the RGBA color mode, indicating that the image supports an alpha channel and the size, determined by a tuple representing the width and height of the image. We've completed the development of the main skeleton and constructors of our classes. Now we can move on to the most exciting part, designing. We will develop our first design template for pins according to the following plan. Let's divide the first stage into the following steps. So let's get started and begin developing a method for drawing the background. We'll need the exact same method for the second template. So let's make it common for both classes and place it in the base class. This method will serve as a hub where we'll perform checks and call methods for color filling and applying gradients. Let's create another method for color filling. This method will take an argument with the color value to fill. Here we create a drawing object on the canvas, then obtain the width and height of the canvas using the size method. After that, we draw a filled rectangle with the specified color using the rectangle method. 
Note how the width and height of the rectangle are set. They are specified using the coordinates of its top left corner and its bottom right corner. Let's return to our background drawing method and add a check. If the overlay background variable is true, we'll overlay an image on the background. Otherwise, we'll fill the background with a color. In the second part of the check, we'll call our method for filling the background. Now, let's call this method in our main generate image method. We can run the bot and see what we've got. But first, we need to handle data opening so that the bot can iterate through the rows in a loop. To do this, let's go to the base class Pinterest and form a dictionary for the generator data file in the open CSV method. Just a reminder, this file and the data in it are obtained as a result of using the writer module in image mode, which we wrote in the previous lesson. We'll pass the read data to the generate image method, but we forgot to receive it here. Let's do that by adding the argument data. We also need to add the same argument to the method in the base class because the signatures of these methods should match. Let's run the bot and see what we've got. The bot finished its work, and we didn't see anything. This happened because we forgot to call the show method on our canvas. Also, we forgot to disable the background image overlay parameter. Let's do that and run the bot again. Alright, now let's add the option to choose a random color. We'll perform a check. If the value of the random background color attribute is true, we'll choose a random color from the random colors tuple and pass it to the fill background method. Otherwise, we'll pass the standard color background color to this method. Let's activate randomization of colors and check the bot's operation. All right, now let's implement overlaying a background image. First, let's get a list of files from the specified folder. To do this, let's write a separate method. Next, we'll perform a check. If the files are obtained, we'll choose a random image from the list of files. Then we'll open this image and convert it to RGBA mode. Then we'll add logic to resize the image to fit the canvas size. We'll resize it based on the canvas width, so we'll specify the necessary width. Then we'll calculate the height and resize using the resize method, passing the new width and height. Then we'll overlay this image on the canvas using the paste method, specifying the coordinates of the top left corner. I've prepared several background images, so let's place them in the backgrounds folder and test the bot in this mode. Now let's add the option to apply a gradient to the image. Let's write a separate method for applying a gradient. Here we'll create a new image with the canvas size and fill it with the specified color. Then, we'll generate a linear gradient that changes from transparent to opaque along the length of the image. The gradient direction is determined by the gradient direction parameter. Then, we'll resize the gradient to fit the canvas size. Next, we'll apply the alpha gradient to the RGBA gradient image using put alpha, making it transparent where the alpha gradient is transparent and opaque where it's opaque. Finally, using alpha composite. We'll merge the gradient image with the canvas, preserving transparency where the gradient is transparent. Let's add the necessary checks and call the gradient drawing method in the background drawing method. Let's test the bot's operation. Okay, everything is working as expected. Now let's move on to drawing the titles of our pins.
Let's create a method called draw title in the class for the first template. This method will take the title text and the path to the title font as arguments. First, we'll create a drawing object and load the font. Next, we need to split the text into lines to fit within the maximum width. To do this, we'll create a separate method called wrap text. Now let's call this method in our draw title method, passing the title text, font object, and maximum font width. Now we calculate the bounding box for the multi-line text using the multi-line text box method. This method returns a tuple of four values representing the coordinates of the top left and bottom right corners of the rectangle. Next, we calculate the width and height of the text. The width of the text is calculated as the difference between the x coordinates of the top right and top left corners of the rectangle, and the height is calculated as the difference between the i coordinates of the bottom left and top left corners of the rectangle. Now we determine the initial position for center alignment. To center align the text, we subtract the width of the text from the canvas width to get the remaining space. Then we divide this value by 2 to get the offset from the left edge of the canvas to the start of the text, which should be the same on both sides of the text for centering. Then we set the color of the title text and draw the text on the canvas using the text method, passing the necessary arguments. Before checking the method, let's call this method in our main generate image method. We need to pass the font path and the title string. We can obtain the title string from the dictionary that comes into the method. Then we'll download a suitable font and place it in the fonts folder. Next, let's construct the font path. Note that the attribute containing the path to the fonts folder is highlighted. This happens because this attribute is not explicitly defined but generated dynamically. All right, let's test the bot's functionality. Now, let's check the bot's performance in the background image overlay mode. we see that we need to adjust the font color for light background images. To do this, we need to check if the background image is light. Here's how we'll do it. We'll add the word light to the file name of the light background image. Then, in the background drawn method, we'll check if the file name includes the word light. In the generate image method, we'll store this result in a variable and then pass it as an argument to the method for drawing the title. Then in this method, we'll make the check and set the font color accordingly based on the background color. Let's test the bot's functionality. All right, let's move on to implementing the method for drawing tip blocks. The first thing we need to do in this method is to determine the distance at which we will draw the tip blocks from the title. To do this, we'll retrieve the height of the title text from the title drawing method. We'll store the result in a variable. Now, let's create the draw text with rectangle method. It will take the tips text, font path, and the height of the title text as arguments. First, we'll create a drawing object and load the fonts for the tips text and numbering. For numbering, we'll use the same font but allow for a different font size. Next, we'll wrap the text lines taking into account the maximum text width. Then, we'll calculate the maximum width of a line in all blocks. Next, we determine the starting I axis position for drawing text. Now we need to create a loop to draw each tip block. Note that we can specify the number of tips in the settings using the tips count attribute. In the loop, we specify this parameter in the slice of the list. 
Also, please note that here we use enumerate starting from 1 to obtain the tip number, which we'll draw inside the circle. Inside the loop, we calculate the bounding box for the multi-line text, then calculate the width and height of the text. Then, we calculate the height and width of the rectangle, and then calculate the starting x-axis position for the rectangle and the text inside it. Next, we convert the rectangle fill color to RGBA format with transparency. For this, we'll create a separate method in the base class. This way, we'll be able to specify transparency for rectangles. Then, we draw the rounded rectangle specifying the coordinates and other parameters. After that, we draw the text inside the rectangle. Next, we calculate coordinates for the circle with the number, convert the color to RGBA format to support transparency, and draw the circle, specifying the coordinates and other parameters. Please note that the circle X and circle I coordinates represent the center of the circle. However, the ellipse method requires specifying the coordinates of the top left and bottom right corners of the bounding box. To ensure correct coordinates for ellipse, we take into account the offset by the radius of the circle. Then, we draw the text inside the circle. At the end of the loop, we increment the i-axis coordinate for the next block and account for the spacing between blocks. Now let's download the font for the tip text, rename the file, and place it in the fonts folder. Then in the generate image method, we'll form the path to the font. Now let's call the method for drawing tip blocks. As the first argument, we need to pass a list of tips. In the table, the tip text is in the format of a numbered list. To extract the tips, we need to create a separate method that extracts elements from a numbered list using a regular expression and returns a list of these elements. Let's call this method in our main method and pass into it the string with tips obtained using the get method from the dictionary. Then we'll pass the list of tips into the method for drawing tips. We'll also pass the font path and the title height there. All right, let's test the bot's functionality. Everything works as expected. We can now move on to drawing the footer with a call to action. The method for drawing the footer will be common for both templates, so we'll place it in the base class. This method will take text and the path to the font as arguments. In this method, we'll create a drawing object and then load the font. Now we need to calculate the dimensions of the footer bar. For this, we need the dimensions of the canvas. We have these dimensions in the attributes of the object, but we can also obtain them using the size method. Then we'll calculate the size of the footer, convert the footer fill color to RGBA format, and draw a rectangle. After that, we'll determine the dimensions of the text, calculate the coordinates for drawing the text, and draw the text. We need to call this method in our main method and pass the text. We'll add a check to allow disabling the drawing of the footer if it's not needed. We can specify the footer text in the settings. However, this means the text will be the same for all projects. So, let's add the ability to specify custom text for each project. To do this, we'll create a footer text file in the project folder and write the text there. Then we'll create a separate method to check for the existence of the file and return the text from it. If the file is not found or empty, the default value from the settings will be used. Now let's go back to our main method and form the path to the file with the text. Then we'll call the getFooterText method and pass the file path and the default text to it. Next, let's place the footer font in the fonts folder and form the path to the font. Now, we'll pass the necessary arguments to the method for drawing the footer and test the bot. 
Great, we finished developing the first template. Now, let's move on to developing the second one. For this template, we already have methods for drawing the background and footer ready because they are common to both templates. And we have already written them in the base class. What remains is to write a method that will draw the title and lay a rectangle underneath it. Let's create this method in the class for the second template. This method will take the title text and paths to the first and second fonts as arguments. In this method, we will add the option to enable or disable the alternative font used for the last lines and the ability to specify the number of these lines. As always, we start by creating a drawing object and loading the fonts. Then we obtain the dimensions of the image, wrap the text, and calculate the bounding box for the multi-line text. Next, we calculate the width and height of the text. Now we need to divide the lines into the first and second sections, which will be written in different fonts. To do this first, we split the lines by line breaks, then we form two sections, taking into account the setting for the number of lines written in the other font. Then we concatenate these lines back with line breaks. Next, we calculate bounding boxes and heights for the first and second texts, adjust the total text height if the another font setting is true, and calculate starting positions for text and the rectangle. Then we adjust the rectangle height based on text and padding, as well as calculate the rectangle width, after which we calculate coordinates for the rectangle. Now convert the rectangle fill color to RGBA format with transparency and draw the rectangle. Now, let's draw the first text and make a check if the another font setting is true. Here we calculate the coordinates along the X and Y axis for drawing the second text and draw the text. The method is written. Now we need to call it from our main method. First, get the title from the dictionary, place the fonts in the font folder of the second template, and form paths to the font. Now call the method for drawing the background, then the method for drawing the title, and finally the method for drawing the footer. Let's test the bot. Switch to the second template by changing the index of the templates list in the main PI file and run the bot. we see that the first part of the text is not perfectly centered. This happened because we forgot to calculate the width of the first section of the text and account for it when drawing the text. Let's fix that. Let's also change the variable name text width to avoid confusion. If you want to draw the first part of the text in uppercase, call the upper method here and here. Also, we can adjust the number of lines that will be written in a different font. Now let's add transparency to the rectangle and change its rounding. We see that there is an issue. Transparency is not applied. To fix this, we need to create a new canvas with transparency at the beginning of the method. And then at the end of the method, apply the alpha channel of this image to our main canvas using the alpha composite method. Now everything works. Let's add a gradient now. We also need to make the same change to apply transparency in the footer method, as well as in the method for drawing tips in the first template class. Let's test the first template again with transparency applied. 
we see another issue at the transparency of each subsequent block increases. This happened because we created a transparent canvas and a drawing object outside the loop. Let's move them inside the loop and test again. Now everything is working as intended. The design template development is complete. All that's left is to configure the saving of images in the folder and add data writing to the table for subsequent uploading. Let's start by adding the option to disable image preview. Now, let's add two more parameters to the constructors of our classes, image format and DPI. Next, let's implement the logic for saving files. We'll add a check to enable or disable saving. Now we need to form the file path. To do this, let's create a separate method in the base class. We'll form the file name using the image number and timestamp. So we'll accept the image number in this method. Then generate a timestamp, form the name and file path, and return the ready path from the method. Please note that the attribute image format is highlighted. This happened because we forgot to create this attribute in the base class. Let's fix that. Let's call this method from our main method and store the path in a variable. Also, let's remember to accept the image number in our main method generate image, then in the main py file. We'll get the number using enumerate and pass it to the method. Now let's create a method to save the image. It will accept the file path and image number, then save the image using the save method and display a message about successful saving. Let's call this method in our main method. Next, let's implement writing data to a file for future uploading. To do this, let's create a method that will generate and return a dictionary with data for uploading. In this method, we accept a dictionary with data and the file path. Then we extract the required values from the dictionary using the get method and form a new dictionary. Finally, we return this dictionary from the method. Now let's go back to our main method, and after saving the image, let's add a check to enable or disable writing data to the file. Now, let's get the data dictionary for uploading and then call the method for writing data to the CSV file, passing the data and the file name as arguments. Now let's add this logic to the main method of the class for the first template. In addition, we also need to make some minor changes in the data writing method to ensure that the headers are written correctly in the generator data file when the writer is working. Let's check the bot's performance. The files are saved and written to the table. The bot works well in both modes. With that, we can consider the development of our image generator complete. Here is your homework for today's lesson. You need to find background images that match the themes of your selected niches or offers. 
experiment with pin designs and customize them to your liking, and generate 100 pins for each offer. That's all for today. Our course is coming to an end. In the next lesson, we will be developing a pinner to automate the uploading of our pins. See you in the next lesson.